Over to you, Dr. Tripti. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Myself, Dr. Tripti Gupta. I'm a trainee uh, with gym physios. So today I have come with an again uh, amazing topic that is Rasta Aesthetica. Last time, those who have attended the lecture might be having a small insight about what it is. So, uh, now we, we are going to cover all the details about this condition. Let's start from here. So what is Meralgia Paresthetica? It is actually a nerve entrapment of lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Anyone can write down the nerve root value of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in the chat box? So the nerve root value is L2, L3. It, uh, some literature say uh, the root value changes from L1 to L3. So there are controversial statements, but the main uh, root value is L2, L3. The patient suffering from Maralgia Paresthetica, we show some typical signs of sensory nerves because uh, lateral cutaneous nerve is a sensory, sensory nerve, purely sensory nerve. So the signs that will be shown are pain, paresthesia, sensory loss over the lateral thigh. If patient comes to you with lateral anterior thigh pain and you like uh, you suggest okay, if you think it is a mirage paresthetica, the first thing what you're going to do is rule out the lumbar spine pathology. Next. Yeah. It is an entrapment neuropathy or neuroma. So what is neuroma? It is a benign tumor of nerve. So uh, this condition can cause with any of this thing, entrapment of the nerve or the neuroma. This is a mononeuropathy. Here mono means single. In this only a single nerve is affected. That is lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is the area under the inguinal ligament where it gets compressed maximum time. What will be the symptoms? Numbness, tingling, paresthesia, burning, sign of nerve impingement, and pain in anterolateral thigh. So, uh, why is this like? If patient comes to you with burning, also rule out the vascular disorders. If patient is having herpes or any vascular condition, then you have to rule it out first. We will again talk about the branches of uh, lateral femoral cutaneous now. There are two branches, posterior branch and the anterior branch. Posterior branch is a small branch which supplies the greater uh, trochanter and the anterior branch supplies the anterolateral part of the thigh which goes all down to, till the lateral knee. These both are sensory branches. So only there will be sensory signs and symptoms that patient will present with. History of this condition. It was Bernhardt in 1878 who first thought that anterior lateral thigh pain and numbness, paresthesia is not associated with surgical procedure. So he got some cases which uh, didn't have any surgical history. So he thought it, it can't be something related to surgery, but this is something different condition. In 1985, Hager was the first who found out that is the compression of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve that is causing such symptoms. In 1895, Ruth reported five patients with similar presentation and he coined the term Meralgia Paresthetica. Meralgia is a Greek term. Meros means thigh and algos means pain. So he was the one who... Uh, named this condition as Maraja Paresthetica. So this condition has Bernhardt's root syndrome or lateral cutaneous nerve neuralgia. 
let's go in detail about the anatomy so here The nerve starts from here, that is lumbar plexus, L2, L3. Here it will go below and lateral to the iliopsoas muscle, above the iliacus, and in ASL um, variations here. Again, the nerve goes down towards the sartorius muscle and below the leg. It exits the pelvic floor from the, under the inguinal ligament. Under inguinal ligament, this is the main area where this nerve can get compressed. This is your inguinal ligament, if you can see the... Yeah, this is your ligament. This nerve gets compressed below the ligament. There are some anatomic variations in the root of nerve. The A, B, and C are the common variation, like, common variation in which you will find like, uh, nerve gets prone to mechanical trauma. Because in these three types, nerve is very close to ASIS. So any dysfunction of pelvis, sacrum, or pubic will cause a shift in ASIS, which will again compress the nerve and there will be symptoms. In type A, nerve runs posteriorly to ASIS. In type B, nerve runs anteriorly to ASIS. In type C, nerve runs medial to ASIS. In D and E, it runs further medially. So there are less chances of them to get irritated or compressed or affected by the position of ASIS. Etiology, this condition can happen in any age, but it is more common in uh, people who are 30 to 40 years of age. Meralgia peristatica appears in one third of children who have undergone for os osteoid osteoma. That is a brain tumor, benign brain tumor. They are the children who go under surgery of uh, osteoid osteoma, they show the symptoms of meralgia peristatica. Mm -hmm. This condition is more common in male population than female. In general population, 4.3 cases per 10,000 patients are seen, and in diabetics, 200 and 4-1 like patients are seen. In diabetic patients, it is seven times more seen than in general population. The position that is going to irritate the nerve is extension or externally rotation of the poor leg. So if, if someone is pro, uh, doing pro performing uh, there is chronic repetitive positioning of lower extremity in extended or external rotated position. The patient can have the symptom of compression of the nerve. It is seven times more common in type 2 diabetes, obesity, pregnancy, wearing tight pants, pelvic dysfunction, SI dysfunction, and pubic dysfunctions. So right now, like before we, uh, we were talking about the anatomic variations, in type A, type B, type C, the nerve runs very close to ASIS. So if the patient is having any of this dysfunction, that is pelvic dysfunction, SI dysfunction, or pubic dysfunction, there is change in the position of ASIS. So the structures over there will get hypertonic, which will cause compression of the nerve. There are two causes. Like we are classifying it broadly into causes. That is one is spontaneous and another one is iatrogenic. Now here, what is iatrogenic? Iatrogenic means it is secondary to any medical condition or surgery. If patient has undergone any kind of surgery or is was having some medical condition. So like in the hospitals, this type of symptoms develop, then it is known as iatrogenic. And spontaneous and it will become idiopathic like unknown cause, metabolic, it can be your diabetes, uh, mechanical bio and biomechanical dysfunctions like pubic symphysis, SI issues. Like then disparity is also one of the cause. In mechanical causes, there can be external pressure or intra-abdominal pressure, both the things, like if there is pressure from the outside on the nerve, 
or the pressure is from the inside to the nerve. In both the cases, the uh, nerve will get irritated and there will be the symptoms. Like uh, the patient will complain about sensory symptoms. What are the external pressures here? If someone is like wearing a seatbelt, girdles that are the tight belts or uh, uh, that we wear on the pants, then tight trousers or corset. So there is an external like, compression on the nerve, which is going to irritate the nerve. In intra-abdominal pressure, obesity, pregnancy, intra-abdominal tumor, bone tumor in iliac crest near ASS, any of this can cause the symptoms. So here we can see like, so we will show a picture about obesity. Here you can see it properly. This is the nerve, normal root. And here in the obese patient, there will be a compression on the nerve. Okay, due to the distension of the abdomen. Abdomen is uh, falling downside. The groin region will get compressed, which can irritate the nerve at times. Same can be the reason in pregnancy, but in pregnancy, again, uh, it can be also due to underlying SI dysfunction or pubic dysfunction that is common in pregnant women. Metabolic causes, diabetes mellitus, alcoholism, lead poisoning, this can cause the isolated neuropathy of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So there are two theories for diabetes. First one is if there is any abnormality in the metabolism of pyruvate, sorbitol and lipid linked to activation or polyol pathway. So what is the sorbitol pathway or uh, polyol pathway? This is a pathway which converts the glucose um, in, into fructose. So the steps are like glucose is first converted into, into fructose. Here, the main chemical that is going to convert sorbitol into fru fructose is the sorbitol dehydrogenase. When sorbitol dehy uh, dehydrogenase is reduced in the body, then the sorbitol will not get converted into fructose and it will get accumulated there which causes diabetes mellitus. So there are three uh, like places in the body where there is less number of sorbitol dehydrogenase. The first one is your eye that causes diabetic uh, retinopathy. Second one is your kidney, which causes diabetic uh, nephropathy. And the third one is nerves. So there is diabetic neuropathy. Second one is uh, when there is a decreased exoplasmic transport, then the nerves swell up and are uh, susceptible to compression. So exoplasmic transport is a transport between the exons from the nerve cell. Uh, it goes away and towards the nerve cells. So the exons are the ones uh, which transmit the signal. So if there is a decreased exo exoplasmic transport, then it can lead to the compression. Now clinical presentation. The patient will come to you with numbness, tingling, pain, burning and decreased sensitivity to pain, touch and temperature. So there will be a numbness in the anterior lateral part of the thigh. Patient will say he can't feel anything over there and he will like when was, if he's rubbing the thigh in this way, so he feels a bit better. There will be hypersensitivity to touch and dysthesia. Tenderness over the lateral inguinal ligament at the point where the nerve crosses the ligament. So there will be tenderness on the lateral inguinal ligament where the nerve crosses the ligament. There are uh, some points where the nerve is more superficial and crosses the inguinal ligament. That is one centimeter medial to ASI and eight centimeters inferior to ASI. So that are the point where if you are touching or if you are like doing a tenal sign, the patient will complain of the symptoms. So this can be also used as a diagnosis of the condition. The condition is often exacerbated by hip extension during walking or getting into and out of the automobile. So patient will complain you when he's sitting in the car or getting out of the car, he gets some sensation or like uh, symptoms on the thigh. And also uh, if he's walking for a long time, the sensation increases. And if he's sitting, the, it will decrease. There will be a pain with prolonged standing and walking and alleviation with sitting. An area of hair loss may be present on the thigh secondary to repetitive rubbing of the region by the patient. So this condition may be present. If it is very chronic, patient is trying to have tendency of rubbing the thigh, there will be a hair loss in that local region. Okay. Uh, I think there are 
talking about eight centimeters, can you explain that a little bit, like eight centimeters? Yeah, so it's, uh, you have to go eight centimeters below the ASI and there you have to palpate or you have to just press the area. That is the area where the nerve is a bit superficial. So when you're uh, pressing it or palpating it, if there is symptoms are generated again, that means the nerve is getting impinged. But this way, uh, there are variation of this according to anatomical variations because we have seen the nerve doesn't have the same root. It can change its root. So we have to palpate the complete area and then you have to check if you are able to produce the symptom or not. So here's the pathogenesis. There are mechanical reason, reasons, hydrogenic reasons, idiopathic and uh, metabolic. In mechanical and hydro, uh, hydrogenic, there will be spine, pelvis and abdominal surgery, pregnancy, obesity, and pressure on the nerve because of belt or tight, tight waistbands. Metabolic, it can be diabetes or obesity. So, in, and in idiopathic, it is seen in the patient 30 to 50 years, which is not actually known the cause. The cause is not that known. Okay. And also in the patient with carpal tunnel syndrome. All these things can cause a compression or injury of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And the injury or the compression of the nerve is only known as myalgia parasitica. Nerve is sensory, so it will only show the sensory symptoms. Symptoms are decreased sensation. Second is dysthesia. Dysthesia is an abnormal sensation. People become uh, like patients complain about some abnormality. They like there is something abnormal feeling there. Okay, then there will tingling, burning, st uh, stinging, and stabbing pain. If you are performing a straight leg test, it will come negative. Pain on palpation of the lateral inguinal ligament. The same we say. So, what is the inguinal ligament? course of inguinal ligament please write in the chat box guys write the anatomy of inguinal ligament attachment sites of inguinal ligament It is from ASIS to pubic symphysis. So if you're palpating an inguinal ligament, the patient will complain of pain because it is the most common site of nerve to get impinged. So there are more two sites where the nerve can get compressed. The first one is when it's uh, like near the L2, L3 region. And the second one is in the intra-abdominal cavity if the pressure is very high. And third one is under the inguinal ligament. These three are the sites where the nerve get compressed. The maximum time it's the inguinal ligament, but these two are also the common sites, uh, like areas. So now uh, we have said like uh, the nerve is sensory nerve and patient comes to you with the uh, same symptoms, collateral thigh pain, anterolateral thigh pain. And you ask, uh, you do some of the assessment while you are doing a PA test uh, if patient reports that there is the pain has been exaggerated what will you think is the nerve uh, lumbar condition or the thigh condition like how are you, you going to rule this out Carpal tunnel syndrome and myalgia parasitica, it is an idiopathic reason. It can be due to diabetes, both of the things, but I have not found any direct correlation about it. I think it can also coexist in pregnancy because what happens in pregnancy is that you have this fluid retention. If you have fluid retention in your wrist, you can get like symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. And if you have fluid retention in myalgia parasitica around your pelvic region or lower abdominal region, you can have symptoms of LCN compression. So it could be because of fluid retention. So how are you going to differentiate lumbar pain and uh, your myalgia pain?
It's a good question. So how would you guys differentiate between if patient has pain in the lateral thigh, how would you differentiate whether the patient has the symptoms are coming from LCN or the symptoms are coming from L2, L3? Or in certain situations, L1, L2. Anybody? So there's a difference between cutaneous nerve and a nerve root issue, right? A lot of answers, <laughs> a lot of answers. Lumbar will follow, follow a dermatomal pattern. You can find the dermatomal findings and there can be some of the motor findings too. But when it is pure Miralgia Paresthetica, it will only show sensory finding and it will not get exaggerated with uh, like when you're checking for the lumbar oh. spine, like it will not follow any dermatomal pattern. Meralgia parasitica does not follow any of the dermatonal pattern. Okay. Yeah. So your lumbar spine exam should be negative with meralgia parasitica because right, lumbar exam should be negative. Segmental mobility should be negative in meralgia parasitica because compression is happening in the groin, right? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Thrupti will talk about the examination and there's a specific way of examining it. So she'll talk about it in coming slides. Thank you for the responses. I think they were good responses. We'll come on the evaluation. How are we going to evaluate this condition? We can do electrodiagnostic testing. That is, we have to stimulate the nerve and just see if uh, there is... With electrodiagnostic testing, you can find if the nerve is actually compressed or not. But there is a drawback for this test. Can someone say what can be the drawback? Anybody can tell us what is the drawback of electrodiagnostic testing? Why it is not like a foolproof test? Why we can't be sure? We can do a electrodiagnostic test of LCN and then we are still not sure whether, and there is a, there is a reason why. Anyone? I, I don't think it has anything to do with F wave here. There is a, why, why can't we be 100% sure that? Because if you know the electrodiagnostic testing, the specificity is very, very high. For radiculopathy and to rule, rule in problems, I think the specificity is very high, like around 90, greater than 95%. But as it is a sensory nerve, I think they answered it. <laughs> yeah. It is a sensory nerve and we can't perform the EMG. And uh, sensitivity and specificity for NCV is low. So that's why we can't be sure okay, if the nerve is affected. Or it is a purely sensory nerve. For sensory nerve, we can't do EMG studies. Second is somatosensory evoked potential. Another test, this is a manual test. As a physio, we are going to perform in our setups and this will help us in diagnosing or ruling out the diagnosis. The first one is pelvic compression test. In this, the patient, you have to ask patient to lie in the sideline position with the symptomatic side up and you will, uh, the examiner will apply a downward compression force to the pelvis and maintain the pressure for 45 seconds. If patient complains of pain, so are you going to rule in? Let's go for like, it is a positive sign. If the symptoms appear, that is a positive sign for the test. Sensitivity of this test is 95% and specificity is 93.3%. So both are very good, but sensitivity is more higher. So this test is going to use to rule out the diagnosis. Okay, you can also use lastic thrusters, that is distraction, compression, hip thrust, sacral thrust, and uh, gallons test. I'll be performing this test, and I think, yeah, I'll be performing all this test on a patient, and you can see this. 
the second one is neurodynamic test for neurodynamic test here we are going to irritate the nerve and if the symptoms appear that means the test is positive in this we will ask patient to lie in the sideline position with the symptomatic side up and knee bent then examiner will stabilize the pelvis with the cranial hand and with the lower hand you have to take the knee in uh, like uh, hold the knee in your uh, caudal hand and you are going to adduct the hip if there is uh, patient complaints of the symptoms that means the test is positive like while you're doing an abduction so this nerve passes from ass above when you're adducting it bring it in, you bring it in the downward uh, like this you're adducting the hip there will be some tension on the nerve so when the nerve is tension if the symptoms appear that means the test is positive then comes nerve block test in nerve block test uh, we use 1% of lidocaine again the site of injection is 1 cm median and 8 cm inferior to assi at the point of maximum or at the point of maximum pain so again you have to palpate it and see for the if there is any anatomical variation and the point where there is maximum pain you have to give the lidocaine injection test is positive if patient has immediate relief for at least 30 to 40 minutes next is tinel sign you have like i explained it before so you have to just press on the path of the nerve if the symptoms produce the test is positive then magnetic resonance neurography it is somewhat like a mri a nerve variation of mri this is in this we are going to scan the nerves how is the root of the nerve is there any compression you can find out in uh mrns so let's perform this three test first what's the pelvic compression test गाइज फॉर दिस पोर्शन यू कैन पेन डॉक्टर टूप दिस वीडियो सो यू कैन सी वॉट शी इज डूइंग थैंक यू so here in this test first patient will be in side line position symptomatic side will be up and you have to compress the area for 45 seconds if patient complains of symptoms that means the test is positive okay second is neurodynamic testing so in this you are going to bend the knee stabilize the pelvis with your cranial hand and bring the hip in halka sort of pad bring the hip in adduction thoda khali karte ha is it visible now stabilize the pelvis and bring the hip in adduction if the symptoms Appear that means the test is positive. So was it visible? It is visible. Yes. Can you guys see, please? Please, please answer on the chat box. I think I can see, but I mean, it's not about me here. Yeah. So you have to palpate the ASS and the pubic tubercle. and this is the way you are going to palpate for the ligament if any point the patient is complaining of severe pain and uh, regeneration of the symptoms that means that is again positive this here or you can just tap in the way like this test is positive and also you in this you can just use a compression test you have to just press the point 
and there will be a pain symptom or the sensory symptoms in the lateral thigh. Thoda khate. Lateral and the anterior thigh, where the patient is going to complain of the sensory symptoms. Hope that was visible. Was very good, Doctor Trupti. So, thank you, sir. Now we will go for differential diagnosis. We have to rule out some of the condition while we are treating the myalgia cases. First one is lumbar radiculopathy because. Many times we misdiagnosed it as lumbar radiculopathy. Right, uh, just now we have discussed. You have to see for the PA right. test, PA spring uh, test, and for the particular pattern. Sorry to interrupt you. Please don't write on the on the on the screen, guys. Yeah, people are writing on the screen. Please don't write. We respect the time Dr. Trupti is giving us, and she's made this detailed presentation on a very complex topic. Yeah. Thank you. The second, we have to rule out. Yes. Uterine fibroids, you have to ask patient about her, um, uh, if she's a female patient, menstrual uh, questions. I think, uh, Dr. Trupti, she's I think... having any PCOS history or... It. I think your your yes, screen, screen is hanging up. Can you say the differential diagnosis again one more time? Because I think I, we could not hear you and people, I think, were not able to hear you. So can you go through the number... All the, all Just the minutes. It is okay. Now, is it audible, sir? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you have to differentiate diagnose for the lumbar radiculopathy, trochanteric bursitis, hip disease, that is hip OA, for nerve root regions, appendicitis, uterine fibroids, or iliac crest metastasis. Metastasis is again a tumor. Lumbar radiculopathy, as we discussed, we have to do some motor testing. We have to check the segmental mobility. Then uh, PA spring test, we can check. We can check for uh, like neural testing we can do. We have to rule it out. For trochanteric bursitis, we have to rule out for GTPS and gluteal tendinopathies. For hip, you have to check for infield. You have to rule out if there is a like hip osteoarthritis. You have to check for the capsular pattern. If the hip is showing the capsular pattern, that is, it is OA. So then you have to check for L2, L3 nerve root regions. Again, appendicitis. Appendicitis is again going to cause the pain. Then uterine, like it will mimic somewhat of the similar pain. Then uh, uterine fibroids, you have to check for uh, any menstrual uh, irregularities or uh, if patient is having PCOS, then iliac crest metastasis. Now we will see different ways to approach it. Manual therapy. There are different ways you can approach the condition. It, the, like in manual therapy, in medicine approach, there is osteopathic approach, chiropractic approach, uh, physiotherapist approach. So we are going to, maximally we will be focusing on the manual therapy approach because we like uh, we have to treat the root cause. Uh, the medicine people and us, there should be some difference. The thing is, if we just treat symptomatically, what is the difference between us? Even they can uh, give the antispasmodic muscle or pain relievers and control the pain. And they give lidocaine or injectables and control the pain. But that is the correct. Is the, is the condition going to disappear? No. After three to four months, again, patient will have the same complaints. So as being a physio, 
we can assess the thing in more detail we can do the correction if it is due to like yeah there will be definitely underlying dysfunction we can correct it and which can cause a permanent relief from of the symptoms on the no like compression on of the no so here we need to do a detail assessment and we have to treat the patient in a proper way so that the patient like uh, symptoms doesn't reappear we can do soft tissue techniques no doubt we can also like uh, um, we can what do we say soft tissue do soft tissue techniques on hypotonic muscles but we have to treat the root cause if we are not treating the root cause we are just doing a symptomatic treatment the pain will again reappear after some days so now we will be seeing some of the osteopathy like uh, manual therapy point of this treatment in manual therapy there are some techniques that is active release technique mobilization and manipulation for the pelvis so here when like we have said also before if there is any kind of dysfunction of pelvic si or your pubis patient will complain of the symptom because there will be a pressure on your nerve okay the like you said we have uh, discussed inguinal ligament it comes from asis and runs in ferro medially towards the pubic tubercle if there is any of the pubic dysfunction or the pelvic dysfunction so this is the root if your pubic shifts down what will be there there will be a pressure on your inguinal ligament if there is strain on the ligament definitely it is going to compress the nerve below so what here you can do you have to correct the pubis or if there is pelvic dysfunction you have to correct the pelvis that will give a good relief and also it will be your actual first line of treatment here we are actually treating the patient so you can do active release techniques mobilization manipulation for the pelvis myofascial therapy for yeah which will be the muscle that are most hypotonic in this case is a iliopsoas and rectus femoris you can do a release of this muscle transverse friction massage of the inguinal ligament because even this will be taught here again we are going for soft tissue then you can give patient some stretching exercises for pelvic and uh, hip pelvic stabilization and abdominal core exercises so stabilization exercises are most important as shorman has said before you have to shorten the lengthen structure then lengthening the shorten structure what we do is we give stretching but what about the short lengthen structure you should focus on strengthening of that musculature you should focus on stabilization even if you are correcting any kind of dysfunction but you are not uh, like training your muscles to hold the bone in that position the after a few uh, like after some time depending on your condition how chronic it is the bone will again tend to sit in dysfunction so you have to teach this thing to your patient ki your bones will be tend to go in dysfunction we are doing a correction but you have to do exercises for stabilization exercises are the main thing who, who are going to maintain and stabilize the pelvis and there will be reduced chances of recurrence another techniques are kt like we give for lymph like drainage thing and dry needling that will be needling along the nerve but this too ha doesn't have that much uh, evidence the second and third one kt and the dry needling so this are some uh, technique manual therapy technique this is the met for innominate dysfunction you have to first check your uh, pelvis is sitting in anterior innominate or posterior innominate and accordingly you have to treat the patient this met here which you are seeing is for anterior innominate and here it is for posterior innominate we will be uh, like demonstrating this techniques too then the common thing with the condition is out flare this is met for out flare and here we are performing a manipulation patient is in side line from back we are just giving a mild thrust this is for lumbar technique if patient is also also showing some lumbar dysfunction this is how we are going to treat the lumbar area lumbar also it can be a closing dysfunction or opening dysfunction so accordingly you have to select the met and perform this is pelvic mmt this is known as shotgun method in this we are doing a pubic corrections so now i'll be demonstrating all these techniques shimmer 
So here, first we will be performing MAT for anterior innominate rotation. For this, we have to take the hip and knee in 90-90 degree. We will be taking it a little back and asking the patient to press my leg downwards. Press 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Relax. Press 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Relax. Here what we are doing is, we are trying to Move the pelvic in the posterior direction. Okay. Can you correlate it? What's happening here? Second one is for posterior nominate. Symptomatic leg. We take it down. Stabilize the pelvis. Ask the patient to lift the leg up. Is it visible? So is it visible? Okay. We will ask patient to uh, like flex the hip. In short, take it up towards the ceiling. Eight, two, three, four, five, relax. Press one, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Press one, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. This was for posterior innominate. Here, what is happening? We are trying to push the pelvis anteriorly, like this. We are trying to push it, bring it anteriorly. So next one is for outwear. We pause the leg over. Like this. We cross the leg, stabilize the pelvis, and ask the patient to press his leg back on our hand, like this, in this way. Okay? Press it back. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Take it in a new range. Okay, press it back. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Press it back. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, done. So here again, what's happening? The pelvis is sitting outward, in outward direction. So this is your pelvis. It is sitting in this way. We are trying to bring it inside. Okay? Now, MET for out there. We'll position the patient. Ask patient to hold your hand. My hand will be contacting the PSS above, like at the back. SS joint. Here I can do this MED for out flare and also the unilateral flexion. So only the hand position matters. Okay. Take a deep breath in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So this is the way we are going to thrust it anterior. Straight. This was MET and manipulation for out flare. Next one is for lumbar. Here there are two ways. One is in Sims position and another is modified Sims position, which we are doing is modified Sims position. We are doing the for opening dysfunction here. Suppose I'm doing it for L3, L4. I will like lock the, all the above segments by pulling the patient in a bit of the flexion and rotation. With another hand, I 
I'll drop all the below segments. In by flexing the knee and bringing the leg down. So here now I can feel movement in my hand above here. I will ask patient to press it down. Press it down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Press it down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Press it down. Two, three, four, five, six. Relax. So this was for opening this function of lumbar spine. Just a minute. The next one is shotgun technique. This is for pubic dysfunction. This is a generalized technique for pubic dysfunction. You can use in all, all pubic dysfunction this technique. This is a generalized technique and also shows a very good result. First, you have to ask the patient to press your hands in outward direction. Press it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Relax. Then you have to ask them to press it in the adduction movement. Press it in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Press it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Press it in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can you see this? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Yeah, it's visible. So this is the way we are going to perform MET for pubic dysfunction. That is a shotgun method. So I hope everyone got how we are going to perform this techniques. At least you have some idea about it now. This all are the techniques actually we go in detail in the courses. Next other technique for treatment is diaphragmatic lift. You can perform a diaphragmatic lift technique. Then peripheral nerve OMT. It is just uh, like you have to performance uh, kind of uh, soft tissue uh, treatment here what are the other approaches it is injury recall technique we can give you pelvic manipulation then inhibited muscles like you have to strengthen the inhibited muscles okay uh, soft tissue technique over the hypertonic muscle which are usually inguinal uh, ligament then your iliopsoas again your uh, rectus so here you can perform some kind of soft tissue techniques. Myofascial therapies, including active stretching and facial releases of the iliopsoas muscle, rectus femoris was conditionally facilitated. Chiropractic blocking technique with pumping type moment manipulation. These all are the techniques that you can perform. So here comes the medical treatment. Conservatively, what they ask is weight loss. Huh? Uh, Dr. Trupi, a couple of questions. Can you talk about diaphragmatic lifting technique? Okay. So I will show it on patient. Sure. <laughs> So here you're going to hold the diaphragm or the like lower thoracic area. And you will, you're going to ask the patient to take a deep breath in and breathe out. Take a deep breath in, breathe out. So here with breathe out, we are going to give a mild compression and uplift to the diaphragm. When the patient is breathing in, we are going to maintain it. And again, when he's breathing out, we will give a mild compression and lift. Uh, take a breath in, breathe out, in. Out, in, out. Okay? Got it? Was it clear, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good.
Now we have come to the medical treatment. There is conservative treatment, interventional treatment, and surgical treatment. Conservatively, what they are like, what is the main line of treatment is weight loss and uh, wearing loose clothes. These are the two things after which there will be a like, patient have shown a significant uh, reduction in the symptoms as this is going to release the compression or pressure on the nerve. Then comes neuropathic pain. For neuropathic pain, we can, uh, like the doctors prescribe, is tricyclic antidepressant, antiarrhythmic, and anticonvulsants. For diastasia, you can apply local ointment like uh, capsic, capsicin and lidocaine cream. Then comes the interventional therapy here, like same what we have done in the nerve block. LFCN infiltration with the nerve block therapy, a local anesthesia with or without a corticosteroid is used. Then pulse radio uh, frequency is the therapy that they use and spinal cord stimulation. <laughs> Surgical, there is neurolysis. Neurolysis with transposition and transection that is removal. Okay. These are the medical treatment what the medicine doctors prescribe. So now, any questions? Guys are asking about diaphragmatic lift technique. What is the injury recall technique? Injury recall technique is nothing. I think it's it's a, it's from chiropractic literature. Yeah. They talk about adjusting the bones to relieve pressure on the tissue. That's what it is. It's a indirectly the same thing what we are doing. We're lining the bones so that we can send signal to the brain that that area is not injured. That's what injury, injury recall technique is. Coming back to osteopathic science, I mean, it's a, it's a similar similar thought process that we're aligning the bones so that we can, we can reduce tension on the inguinal ligament. Spinal cord stimulation sometimes is given, given to patients. I mean, if they have chronic pain, it's a device I think that was developed in Boston many years ago and is given to patients, which is a it is basically stimulating the spinal cord to modulate pain. Okay. As far as I think one of you asked di diaphragmatic lift technique. Diaphragmatic lift technique is very similar. What you're trying to do is you're training the diaphragm as you're training other pelvic stabilizers, as you're training other muscles, because we know that biomechanically if things are shifted, you want to train everything around around it. Right. There is no specific, I think there's no specific relationship with diaphragmatic technique with myalgia prosthetica management. BAS and I don't think there's a specific outcome measure for myalgia prosthetica. I don't think there's any specific. I think it's such a rare condition. I don't think there's any specific. You're gonna you're gonna check the pain and you're gonna check the sensation. Yeah, those are the specific. There are no, I don't think there are any specific measures. I can look it up, but I don't think there are any specific functional outcome scales for myalgia paresthetica. There's very little literature written from like a manual therapy perspective. How would you summarize the topic? I think she has a couple of interesting case studies. And we will share the recording on the on the YouTube. So yeah, I think we'll have it. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Trupi has like a couple of case studies and that actually summarizes the topic the best. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any questions till now, guys? Any questions? So we can go for case studies. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think people are asking about spinal cord stimulation. Let me answer spinal cord stimulation and then we can actually go. So people who have chronic pain, chronic nerve pain, people who have diabetes, people who have different types of injuries or different types of chronic pain. There is one, there is a, there is a, in, there's a surgical way of managing pain. And this usually comes from like pain management side of things. What, what people do is they would, they would give you like a spinal stimulator, which means that there's a device that has been put in your body after around your, around your iliac crest. And what it would do is it would stimulate the spinal cord. And what it does is it neuromodulates the pain, especially people who have chronic pain. Okay. Inguinal hernia and there is a possibility because inguinal hernia can cause pubis dysfunction. So yeah, that's a possibility. Okay, over to you, Dr. Tupi, I think. Yeah. Let's now go towards the case studies. Yeah. 
the first case study this is of 68 years old overweight female she had a history of bilateral mastectomy secondary to breast cancer and presented with numbness and tingling of the anterior and lateral aspect of the right lower extremity for past several weeks patient stated that she spends hours a day knitting on a couch in which she tucks her right foot under her buttocks and keep her lower extremity flexed and externally rotated so here what all we can see the patient is 68 years old overweight female there is a history of bilateral mastectomy and patient is having numbness tingling on the anterior lateral aspect of the leg and she asked on knitting on the couch with her leg in flexed and external rotated position what are her physical findings are normal stance gait muscle strength testing and reflexes of lower extremity everything is normal but there is diminished sensation to touch on the lateral and the anterior aspect of right thigh her bmi is 29 other vital signs and other physical uh, exam findings were normal this is our clinical findings there is bilateral hypertonicity of sous muscle at right side it's more than left l2 l3 closing dysfunction asi is compression positive that was a pelvic compression supine to sit right long to long sitting flexion right positive sacral base right deep ila right prominent so please write the diagnosis what do you think what we what is the case and how are you going to diagnose this case what do you think is the diagnosis do you think this is myalgia parasitica how many of you guys think this is myalgia parasitica and how many of you th don't think this is myalgia this is not myalgia parasitica anybody disagree you 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 have also have like low back findings how can yeah. you call it myalgia parasitica one of you got it right one of you got it right so what are the dysfunctions here what's happening like at the pelvic level at the sacrum level what are the findings it is actually a double crush syndrome what's happening guys you can see that you have like two findings you have the compression asi is compression test being positive and you have findings of innominate and pelvis and then you have also have you also have findings of findings of l2 l3 yeah Yeah. You can say that this patient has right pelvic out flare and unilateral sacral flexion, correct? And then patient also has signs of double crush. Okay. Yeah. 
And then you have closing dysfunction. So this patient is getting compression at L2, L3, and this patient is also getting compression at, also getting compression at in nominate, okay? Close to the ASIS, okay? Is that clear? Any questions regarding this? Dr. Trupti, do you wanna add anything here regarding this case study? Oh, you're, oh, you're muted, sorry. Yes, so this is a double crush syndrome where the nerve is compressed at two sides. Like uh, there is dysfunction at uh, of the lumbar region too, but nerve is also getting compressed in the, uh, like your inguinal area. The patient is sitting in out flare. So if you're correcting the dysfunction and working on the patient in a proper way, you're covering all the dysfunctions and giving a proper uh, strengthening and stretching protocol, the patient will can get a good relief from the symptoms. So basically you're getting like a dual compression. You're getting a dual compression, you're getting a compression and you're getting a compression in the groin or around ASIS. So that's why this person is getting this, these symptoms, okay? So second case study, it is a, of uh, 24 years female. She complained in the, she has complained in the second month of her pregnancy of pain, numbness, tingling and burning on the outer aspect of the left leg. Her previous history is negative. She has suffered from uh, various paresthesia in hand and feet. Her father is living and in good health. Her mother suffers from melancholia and is extremely gouty and neurotic. The symptoms continued until the termination of pregnancy becoming so severe after the seven month that she was obliged to remain in bed. After delivery, the paresthesia became less severe but are still present. The skin is not sensitive to touch but pressure causes considerable pain. These are her clinical findings. Hypertonicity of iliosos muscle and TFL left side. Obus test positive on left side. ASI is compression positive on, positive on left, supine to sit, left long to short, sitting flexion, left positive, pubis uh, inferior and anterior on left, pure left pubic rami, tender to pulpit, adductor hypertonicity, L1 and L1 to L3, there is no dysfunction or no radiation. So, diagnosis. So what do you guys think this person has? This person has interior nominate, okay. What else? Can we say this is Meralgia Paresthetica? We have ruled out lumbar spine. There is no radiation, no dysfunction. Okay. Yep. Pubic symphysis dysfunction is there. Okay. You have inferior and interior pubic symphysis, right? Yep. IT band syndrome, you can say, but I mean, it's like TFL is hypertonic, yes. Okay. Can anybody tell me what is happening at pubis? That is what the critical thing is. And Dr. Tupti will give you the answer on this. But can you tell us what what, what is happening at pubis? What kind of dysfunction the, does the pubis has? Anybody?
open dysfunction i mean you are you're almost right but i think i i need a better answer than open dysfunction of can you tell me what is happening at pubis Can 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 anybody tell me what is the role of what is the role of having a TFL hypertonicity here? Is there any relevance of TFL TFL hypertonicity here? As we we're talking about, does TFL hypertonicity has any relevance? Look, just looking at just purely looking at the anatomy of the two structures, like looking at the anatomy of location of TFL and looking at the anatomy of uh, lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, is there any relevance? TFL causes anterior rotation, yes, yeah, surely. But I mean, they're right next to each other, right? Anatomically, it runs along. The lateral is now like if the fibers run along. If can we are not hundred percent sure, but can can it impact it? Probably gluteus medius is weak for sure, right? So you definitely have to look at what what TFL is doing and you have to release sometimes release TFL I mean I, I'm not a fan of needling a hypertonic muscle but sometimes you can I'm still waiting for your answer on pubis. Can you guess, give us the answer what is happening at pubis? Guys, after this, I will share the quiz link with you guys on the group. Okay, you can, you can try the quiz. If you score greater than seven on 10, you'll get the certificate, okay? Can anybody tell us what is the dysfunction, opening dysfunction of pubis? I think you're not, you have to give us the accurate dysfunction at pubis. We're still waiting for that answer. Otherwise, Dr. Tripti will answer us. Yeah, there are two things that are happening at the pubis. And we talk about treating the pubis dysfunction specifically in the program, how you can address these pubic dysfun pubis dysfunctions. Because that makes a huge difference. Inferior dysfunction, I agree with, but there's another thing that is going on. Dr. Kruti, you want to tell us what is going on at the pubis? And so the pubis is sitting inferiorly and anteriorly. This is open abduction uh, dysfunction of pubis with inferior dysfunction. What's happening here is pubis is sitting inferiorly and in open abduction uh, like position. There will be a uh, stretch on uh, like inguinal ligament, what Mary Ma'am said. But there are due uh, dysfunction of the pubis. One is open abduction and second is inferior dysfunction. Yeah. And this is purely a case of Meralgia Paresthetica. Yeah. So you have ruled out the lumbar pathology, no radiation, no dysfunction in the lumbar spine, right? If you are finding a dysfunction in the lumbar spine, then yes, you are, then that's a dual thing. But I mean, got double crush. But this is like purely happening at the ASIS level. Yeah. Purely happening at the ASIS level. So this is MP, Meralgia Paresthetica. Okay. Any questions you have regarding this case study or the whole presentation in general, guys? Okay. Any questions regarding the today's presentation?
always look for always okay supine to set is long to short is anterior nominate short to long is posterior nominate okay yeah. uh, if i have to summarize this lecture in 2 minutes this is what it happens if patient comes to you and i'm seeing this patient in the clinic i'll just give you a little case study i mean and little history of this patient the patient called me and she had anterior lateral thigh pain a lot of numbness tingling burning on the lateral thigh and